What's up guys? Before today's episode begins, I just want to clarify a few things. Today's episode is gonna be two episodes in one. This episode was recorded back in June. I'm gonna speak about some personal things in the first part where I continue the story of Calligraphy Masters. I've been postponing this podcast for quite some time because editing it, I was not sure if I'm gonna post it. It feels really stressing talking about this stuff and if you're watching, you see what I'm talking about in a bit. But yeah, I just wanted to clear out this because this is the reason there haven't been any podcasts lately, but we are back. <laughs> okay, let's do it again. Hi everyone, welcome back to NIPS, the podcast. I'm your host, Milenis. And I'm your host, Paul Antonio. And this is the show where we discuss everything about calligraphy, lettering, and sign painting. <laughs> so, hey Paul, finally, like, actually this week is a pretty busy one. We record a lot of episodes, like, even though people just heard the first episode. So they'll, they'll, they'll just get a whole slew of them together. No, that's not the case. Uh, every, <laughs> there is one podcast coming a week, but... Uh, because you're, you have uh, a lot of stuff that's going on in your personal life and uh, we have to record a bunch of episodes because over the next uh, one, two months, Paul, it's going to be quite busy and this is the way we do it. Today well is uh, June the, 7th, the 16th and you're going to hear this podcast probably July, maybe August, I'm not sure, but yeah. yeah. <laughs> So, uh, today I'm having some uh, Irish tea and coke <laughs> for the podcast. <laughs> the, I, I, Irish tea, is, is that like whiskey? <laughs> no, this, Irish, this is Irish tea, it's a... Uh, yeah, Irish tea. <laughs> yeah, guys, usually I don't drink uh, alcohol, not that this is alcohol, this is Irish tea, but uh, it's been... I was horrified. It, Milan came to stay with us and he wouldn't even drink with us, but you know, it's okay. <laughs> uh, most of the time I drink water. Water is the best. You should drink only water. But today I have uh, Irish tea because uh, it's been hell of a week. Uh, 16 hours of work every day from 8 in the morning till 11, 12 in the night. I'm not complaining. Uh, I'm super happy. Great results, but that's why I'm with the tea today. <laughs> wow. For me, it's... For me it's a fresh ginger and lemon tea every day <laughs> okay guys let if if you're watching on youtube let me let us know in the comments what your favorite tea to drink <laughs> so what's your favorite drink for the day yeah today guys uh, we're gonna con uh, discuss uh, three topics as usual you know nips podcast is in three segments first 15 minutes i'm gonna talk about topics that i chose Se Second part, uh, topics that Paul have chosen to talk about. And third part is uh, topics and questions that you send us on Instagram at uh, Nips Podcast. Uh, yeah, uh, I'm gonna, <laughs> like, I'm pretty sure Paul is not so happy about what I'm gonna talk about. Oh, but... goodness. I don't know. Oh, oh yes, okay, okay. <laughs> Be it's, it's because... Go, uh, go ahead. I feel it's, uh, it's important to, like... My, my part, I'm going to continue the story of Calligraphy Masters and uh, more particular about myself. I usually don't like to talk about myself. I'm, I'm a very close person. I'm kind last in the first episode, I told you I have been 11 years bartender where I was, I had to be open. I had to talk with everybody, but this is 11 years of uh, interacting with drunk people, with, per, with people who are under uh, drugs and stuff and uh, working in the nights the moments when i'm supposed to sleep so at one moment uh, this became very toxic and me being a very open and extroverted person i turn out to a person who is very introverted very close and i don't allow so many people around me uh, paul know it very well he is one of the people who knows me really well my whole personality a lot of things that you don't know about me and I try to be a good person, I'm at least a good hearted, but uh, sometimes I'm, I'm rude to people, sometimes I'm great, aggressive. It could be not on, on intention, but sometimes it's on intention because I just deal with a lot of it and uh, I'm not trying to... Man. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I'm gonna... It's fine. I'm gonna uh, censor it, but anyways... Uh, I've known Milan for a long time and... Um... You, you'd, you'd be a, 
astounded by what Milan has been through in his life and what he's accomplished with calligraphy masters is really quite amazing. So in the first episode, I mentioned some things about me being bartender and stuff like this, but I think I didn't mention. I lost my mother when I was 20 years old. Uh, I don't have father like I have. I've seen him two times in my life, but yeah, this is something that influenced me hugely in my life. It's it's not the, the biggest problem in the life. I, I'm pretty sure everybody has their problems, but this was something that made a lot of changes with me, the person who I am and how I turned out, turned out as a person uh, through the years. I've always tried to be good and to be polite, but uh, life told me that when you're too good with people, they're just, uh, I don't know how to say, like my English is not perfect, that's why sometimes uh, I say things that people get it wrong. Yeah, I'm usually a very direct person. Like, I don't follow the political correctness, this whole, this... <laughs> no, let's not censor anything, but... Uh, when I'm not happy, I I'm not gonna pretend that I'm happy. If, if I feel something, I'm not gonna pretend as something else. This social media world that we live, and especially Instagram, makes people try to show their best, like, the best thing on the picture, I'm the best person, I'm so good and everything and this is fake. We live in a far, in a very fake world and it, this is something that I'm not and I'm not even trying to be. When I feel angry, if you catch me and if you provoke me, you will feel it. Uh, I know I have responsibility with calligraphy masters but at the same time, uh, this is who I am and there are reasons behind my actions. I, I don't do so every time on purpose, but uh, what I mean is uh, I'm doing everything with good intentions and even though I have bad sides of myself, like we're all humans, nobody's perfect. I'm not even trying to be perfect. That's why I'm showing you who actually I am. If you haven't been in my shoes, you cannot understand 100% why I do certain things. If I've been uh, aggressive, rude, or too direct to you, it's not personal, it's just, this is life. Sometimes stuff like this happens. And um, I think with my actions and calligraphy masters, not, I'm not only speaking words. I, if, you, if you're following for more time, you understand that what I'm speaking is what I'm doing. Like, I think actions speak louder than words. And uh, I've done a lot of sacrifices in my life. And with, with my art, with calligraphy and calligraphy masters, and usually I don't agree people to talk about stuff like this. Uh, I'm not bragging about it. I'm not complaining, but I think it's important to speak about this so you understand as much as possible why I do certain things. Um, I do what I love, I do what I, is what makes me happy. Uh, I don't care about numbers. People who who are in the art for the numbers, for the fame, I guess some of you already know this piss me off. I don't like them, I don't support them. Uh, the real calligraphers, the real artists put the time, put the work, put the sweat, everything. Uh, nothing is easy, life is hard and uh, I don't like people who try shortcuts like this is just this fake world, this Instagram and everything. Of course, everybody w wants to be successful. I guess a lot of people want to make a living out of what they love. But if your intentions are real, really like this and they are pure, you won't do a lot of the stuff that I see so many people do and which drives me crazy. Of course, one of, one of the other things that you probably don't know about Milan is he's actually very spiritual. <laughs> <laughs> That's funny, like, uh, I wouldn't even have thought to speak about this with people. Yeah, I, I'm not, so I, when... I, don't, I don't consider myself so spir spiritual, like, I don't consider myself uh, good in anything. I'm, uh, I'm trying my best to learn and improve every day in different area of my life. <laughs> and, uh, yeah, I don't know what Paul wanted to say. I just... When, when, when I, Milan and I had been talking for quite some time before we actually met physically. And, um... I, I met him at the um, at the words event in Milan. How long ago was it? Five years ago? I think it was 2016. 
and um, and I did some Reiki with him, and it, it really surprised him how powerful healing is and how, how Reiki works. And how there's so much access to energy around us, and all we have to do is to be open to it. And since then, he's, he's really sort of opened up to the universe and to, to being much more connected energetically. So it's it's uh, we've had some great conversations about this kind of thing. So, so it's it's just another little side to Melen that uh, I thought would be useful for you to know. Uh, I know this might sound crazy to people. I'm just saying it for fun, but uh, I'm I'm very happy with myself with the person I've turned out. Uh, as I said, I don't want to brag, I don't want to flex or anything like this. But I'm happy with the person who I am. I know some people have seen sides of me which they don't like. But that's life. Um, as I said, that's okay. Lots uh, of us love you. Like you guys, you know how big is calligraphy masters. Even though it's nothing so much, but consider the calligraphy world, it's kind of a big thing. And uh, you, you have to keep in mind, I'm one person, and for seven years I, I've been doing pretty much everything by myself. And I'm not professional in any in anything. Uh, when I need marketing. I go on YouTube, I learn marketing, I apply, experiment, try, and so on. When I started the YouTube channel, I never edited a video. Same thing, go on YouTube, learn, apply. Everything uh, I've done uh, this way. I know I've done a lot of mistakes, but I've done it uh, in my own way. And that's why I would never change anything uh, from my journey, because this, as I said in the first uh, uh, episode, uh, this is the best thing that happened to my in my life, calligraphy masters. Every all the people who have something to do in a way, either followers, either friends, calligraphers, uh, people from the crew, and stuff like this. But uh, you have to understand, it's a lot of work, and uh, being all the time on the computer and on the phone. Yeah, I know today all the people are spending a lot of time, but I've been doing this seven, eight years consistently much more than the usual person. And you have to understand no matter how good you try to be, no matter how spiritual you are or you're trying to be, this drives you crazy. And when you have, when you have a vision, standards and stuff like this, and when you see people that, that do things which are wrong, in my opinion, sometimes I become like a, I don't know, like a bomb, I explode. Uh, I think I've showed that very few times. Uh, it's, as I said, I'm not doing it on purpose, but stuff like this happens. My point is, uh, you have to do what you have to do if you really love it and not for your own sake. Uh, calligraphy Masters, since the beginning, it's, it's been for the sake of calligraphy to continue live in this uh, more and more virtual going to life i don't know yeah you know my english is not the perfect but i'm pretty sure most of you are getting my points success is not uh, owned it's least and the rent is due every day i don't know how many of you will understand this quote but it is a very strong one just because you have some numbers it doesn't mean anything even even if you have millions you have to stay humble you have to be human because Yes, you achieved stuff, but it's gone. It's it's in the past, and it doesn't mean it's gonna stay forever. If you don't put hard work every day, nothing gonna stay forever. And uh, uh, I shared a number of personal things, things which are which I usually wouldn't share, but as I said, I think they're important for the true supporters of calligraphy masters to know about and. Uh, Stuff that I didn't mention, just as Paul suggested to me, is more uh, more about my journey, like how I started and all the tools that I've used in the beginning. Uh, like I start, I in the first episode I said I started because of tears and blah blah blah. If you haven't heard the story, go listen to episode one. But it was funny because for a long time I didn't have any calligraphy proper tools. I had some uh, highlighters, like those markers, you know, they're, I'm pretty sure this is not a calligraphy tool, but they were with a broad edge tip, I don't know, tip is proper. Chisel edge tip. Chisel edge tip. And uh, 
So I, I still have some pictures uh, from my first works. I will put some here just to show, like, it's a joke, but this just shows you guys uh, what a passion and love I have for calligraphy. Like, I wasn't like, oh, what's the best tool to do, do calligraphy? Like, what is this and this? I need the, those pens. Yes, I, I dream to have pilot parallel pens, but since day one when I fall, fell in love with, calligra with calligraphy and with pilot parallel pen particularly, there's been probably like a, about a year before I got my first pilot parallel pens. So gosh, I rem I, I remember when they were make when they had just started designing them. When was this? You, do you know what oh year? Oh god, this was. Uh, let's see. They sent me some samples to test. I think in maybe 2000, 2001. Mm -hmm. um, wow! So I tested them way back. It might be a little bit later. What? It might be a little bit later. It might be. It might be. It might be two thousand and three or four. Um, but I, re I remember when they were just starting to work on them. <laughs> and there you are going. Oh, I was wishing for them, you know. <laughs> <laughs> so that's that's quite funny, you know. You you because in, in your mind. That was your sort of tool of choice, and it, and, and well, I, I knew that tool before it was even invented. Yeah, that's 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 actually crazy. I'm, I'm like blown away right now. But because sometimes just being with myself, I've been thinking like coming back to this moment when I saw the video of Tios and just watching it over and over. And I was thinking, okay, this happened in 2013, but when were pilots actually? designed when were people starting to use them i have asked myself but i never talked with anyone about it so now that you're saying it is like kind of crazy but i think it's cool like it's cool yeah uh, i think a lot of people nowadays are falling in love with calligraphy in a way because of pilot parallel pen and they have this idea that uh, i'll get this pen and i will write as beautiful a lot of people believe that the pen makes letters when... Uh... But, but, but don't forget, you know, a lot of people, I think more people, do pointed pen work. They fall in love with calligraphy through the pointed nib than the broad edge tool. Do you think so? Like, it's, a, it's funny because yeah, my favorite, like, you're a person who is like focused mostly on pointed uh, nibs work, like calligraphy. No? no. Okay, you do a lot of work. Like, come on, you like your copper plate is like uh, genius. And... Yeah, I mean that's that's what you see. But a lot of the stuff I do is broad edge work. You know, I do tons of fracture and textualis and no, Roman and true. italic. That's not true. <laughs> <I'm> just <laughs> <laughs> let, let me go and grab. Let me go and grab something to show you what I'm doing. Uh, so, yeah. Guys, my point is, uh, I forgot my point. You, like, Your you see, point this, this point, this podcast is suppo su supposed to be informative, but that's actually what's happening when uh, me and Paul talk. Sometimes we just go talk about yeah, all look, kinds look, of... Look at this, look at this. Yeah. I know, I know. You've shown me this. I've seen it in, in person, I believe. And I've seen... Uh, you wouldn't have seen this in person. I, I only wrote this about. May then uh, you shown me ago. on Zoom. Showed me on Zoom. Yeah. I think Tim was with yeah. you or something like this. Yeah, guys, this is a, a something that I'm benefiting from being uh, <laughs> close to Paul. I see a lot of stuff that you don't see. So I'm here just <laughs> flexing. <laughs> just kidding. I'm not flexing, but it's, it's the truth. Uh, I'm, a, I'm a very blessed to have friends like Paul and to be able. <laughs> To see behind the scenes a lot of things before many others. Well, the people. feeling is mutual, in the land. The feeling is more than mutual. Well, uh, so I have like a few more minutes to talk before we finish today. So, uh, so let's go back to this this par pilot parallel pen thing that you were. Yeah, and uh, the funny thing is, I think because I was not so like I have to get this pen right now in order to be good. I was just working with what I have. After a few months, I bought uh, some uh, Browse Broad Edge nibs. It was fun. It was hard for me. And uh, what? Yeah, I didn't know this. Yes, I, I first I wrote with the uh, uh, Browse nibs before I got my Pilot. But 
the thing is, even the brows today, like, I'm at the point where me writing with uh, with the brows in a broad edge nip and me writing with a pilot for a pen, there is no difference. I can achieve pretty much the same results. Of course, there are some some small things and uh, stuff that are unique to, to the pilot and some stuff that's unique to the brows, but in general, I'm able to achieve pretty much the same things, which back then, for me, I was like, this is impossible. You have to have the pilot to be so good. <laughs> but the thing, just because uh, I, I waited the time, I was writing with uh, non-calligraphy markers. I was writing with some nips, trying all kinds of crazy stuff. By the time I got my pilots, I had some experience and uh, I, I cannot know for sure, but I think uh, it is it's, it is much better to spend some time writing with some whatever tools. The best thing I think is some broad edge nibs if you are into fracture or something like this or some um, pointed nibs depending what made you fall in love with calligraphy. But yeah, before pilot, uh, Try some other stuff. Don't start. Don't start with pilot, guys. Like, don't listen to me. Like, you can do whatever you want. This is just my thoughts, <laughs> sharing here. Uh, I'm a person who don't like to say to people what to do, but sometimes I catch myself in the <laughs> in the podcast giving a lot of suggestions. Just understand, this just goes automatically. I'm just sharing my thoughts, and it, just because I say it, it doesn't mean you have to do it. I know a lot of people listen to what I say and they think it's important but keep in mind I consider myself the most the weakest part in the calligraphy masters crew I have the least skills so even though a lot of people they talk all kinds of oh like this doesn't mean anything to me I'm, I'm a realist person I work with professionals and I know where my skills are my point is as we discussed in a, for I don't know one or two episodes ago about uh, the skills that you act actually have to have before you start teaching people. Not that suggesting something is teaching, but I'm so crazy that I don't want to be <laughs> to feel responsible for your life. I'm sharing my thoughts, I'm sharing some suggestions, but you have a head on your shoulders, you decide what to do. Spend some time, make a good research, don't listen just to one person, if, even if it's Paul, even if it's some crazy master, always try to have a bigger eye on things, research different uh, points of view and use your head. Use your head. Don't be lazy. <laughs> I'm saying things which annoy me by four, seven years we're working on with all kinds of people, not only the people I work, but also fans or some crazy people seek for attention and stuff like this. I'm just sharing stuff that I think it's not helping some people. <laughs> And yeah, I don't know, Paul. I have two, three min more minutes for my topic. And so I, I just want to touch very quickly on something Milan talked about. You know, <clears throat> the Pilot Parallel pens are excellent tools. But the tools, they, they, didn't, they weren't around forever. And fountain pens weren't around forever. In fact, we had dip nibs long before we had fountain pens. We had quills before we had dip nibs. So one of the great things about the Pilot Parallel Pen is there's a cartridge. The tip is sharp, so it allows you to produce really sharp lettering. But do not rely on this tool to do the work for you. And this is one of the biggest downfalls of this pen. It's so good at what it does, it tricks you into a false sense of security. You need to graduate to dip nibs. Feel how those nibs work and when you get to the point where you're conversant with these dip nibs especially you know your broad edge nibs because if you're talking about pilot parallel pens you are thinking of broad edge tools you want to move from those pilot pens to maybe try an automatic pen or one of the pratic pens because they, they work in the same sort of way you're learning to control the flow of ink Fountain pens are very problematic in that you are sitting there for a long time and the ink is just flowing. When we're dipping, we write, we know we're running out of ink, so we have to be conscious of what's happening. And then you go and you dip. And that movement helps to stretch the muscles. When you have a cartridge and you're in the same place writing over and over and over, your neck's going to start hurting, your arms hurting. So the, the dipping is really helpful. 
helping your body to stretch its muscles. Mm -hmm. Graduate through the tools. Start with your pilots. Go on to, you know, the automatics or your aquatic pens. Go on to the, uh, the nibs. And if, if you get to a point where you really want to try, then try the quills because nothing we have can produce a line like a quill. You know, I have like, I think, one, two minutes to, to wrap my part. And I think this is a great way what you start, started talking about because next part we speak about understanding tools and materials. So this was just kind of like an intro into it. But before I wrap this part, guys, uh, I, I hope in the last episode and this one I shared enough things that you understand me better and know better who I am. For now, I think this uh, topic is closed, but that's my thought. If you think there are more things you feel curious about, what or why I do, or whatever it is, feel free to drop a message under the video if you're watching on YouTube, or just uh, drop a DM on Instagram at Nips Podcast. So, yeah. let's jump into the second part. <laughs> okay, understanding tools and materials. Paul Antonio. All right, in, in this segment, we're going to talk about understanding tools and materials. Now, this is a very broad topic. So where do you start? Well, the first thing you want to do is start with the tools and the materials. Oh, really? We'll start with tools first. <laughs> really? We'll start with tools first. Okay. What? Oh, just before, it, just before so, we start, I'm, I'm hearing a question. I'm just curi curious. Tools, are they not the same as materials? Like. Like, what's, what's no. the difference? Okay, so that, that's a great question, right? So I, I always separate tools and materials and techniques. Mm -hmm. Of course, I then separate scripts as well. Because tools are the things you use to write with, to write in. But not necessarily the things you use to write on. Okay. So for me, materials are things like more paper, um, and complex things like um, pigments. If you if you decide to make your own ink, I wouldn't call that a tool. I would call that a material. Yeah, yeah. Okay, I, I make um, sense. And so there are some crossovers. Like you know, you you could um, could some could inks. Some, I would could something be a tool and a material at the same time? Of course, of course. It like can. what? So you know, for me, some some inks inks. I would sometimes con mostly consider materials, but they fall under the category of tools sometimes, especially for me, if it's an ink that I use all the time. Okay, give me an example for such ink that you use all the time. Uh, so the three inks that I use quite uh, rigorously, um, one range is the Monteverde inks because it comes in such a really lovely range of color. Um, gouache I use quite a lot, but I, I class that as a material, not as a tool, because you have to mix it and add stuff to it. Mm. Uh, there's the Kurotaki Vermilion, which, which I, I love. What? Yeah, like, I, I know this ink so very well, but I never owned a, part, a piece of it or I never written with it. What? Why didn't you take a bottle when you were here? It's, it's your, I'm not just gonna grab some. Oh my <laughs> gosh, there's tons of them here, you should have taken a bottle. Um, and I, I used to use Pelican 4001 quite a lot, but then the papers produced started to change a little bit. And this is, this is where understanding what's going on is really important. So I, I love Pelican 4001. That was the ink that I used when I was growing up as a child. Um, that and Quink. Um, and the formula they tended to stay, they're, they're roughly the same formula, mm -hmm. but the papers started to change. So once paper starts changing, how the ink interacts with the two, with the, with, with the paper becomes a huge issue. And that's why understanding how the tools and materials are working um, is, is really important. I remember I, I used to use, um, I still use Winsor Newton gouache quite a lot. And I was really lucky that I had a really good relationship with them. I had a couple tours of their factory. I was able to see how they make their Which gouache. Which country is this? This is, this is here. Oh, really? Um, oh, but they, yeah. they moved their production to France. Um, and we, they used to have a technical skills day for 
artists that they worked with to come in and talk to their team, their, their um, development and uh, research, research and development team. And one day I was using some gouache and I was writing and it didn't do what it normally did. And so I, I went into this technical research and I said, who changed the formula for the gouache? <laughs> and the technical team said, how do you know how do you know we changed the formula for the gouache? <laughs> and I said, because I've used this gouache for the last twenty years and it's not doing what it normally does. What have you done? <laughs> and what they did was to standardize the way in which the pigments were made, they decided to make because the thing about pigments is this different colours work at different micron sizes. When you're accustomed to grinding pigment yourself you can feel, um, so we grind pigment between, on a sheet of glass with a muller. With what? A muller. 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 a muller. <laughs> what? So it's, it has a, it has a, a handle. Okay. What? And it's <laughs> sandblasted. Me, so it's a little bit to rough. To me this looks like something else. <laughs> but, oh, shut up. <laughs> But what you do is you have another piece of sandblasted glass and you put the pigment on the glass and you're grinding. So it's a flat surface grinding against another flat surface and the pigment gets crushed really finely. Now, you could do this with, uh, with red for a week and the red would be, the red would be magnificent. Mm -hmm. So I'm just going to grab some pigment. So this is a this is the red pigment, right? Mm. It looks like pink. Oh, well, it looks like pink here. It's actually red. Mm. And this is it when it's ground. Okay, now that looks red. Now, red, the finer the particles, the more light they absorb and the more light they reflect. Blue, on the other hand, cannot be ground quite finely. Because once you grind it beyond a certain microbe size, it doesn't reflect the light, it absorbs the light and it looks really dull. But because they changed all the particle sizes to the same size, because it, you know, it, it made the production a little bit easier and, and, and much, much easier to clean and much, much easier to have to mix color together if you're working with a lot of color. But because calligraphers work with so little bit of color, we were really sensitive to these changes in, 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 in the, in the gouache. So little things like that make a huge difference in understanding how, how you're actually producing your work. A lot of people say, you know, oh, I can't do this. I can't do that. You know, the nib isn't working. This isn't working. And, you know, a lot of the time it's because you don't actually know if that ink will work in that nib on that paper so not all inks work on all nibs and on all papers because papers are so varied in 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 their range of possibility so you have cold press papers hot press papers not press papers and then you have coated and uncoated and textured and untextured so that's your sort of starting point the thickness of the paper is equally important because if the paper is too thick the paper doesn't respond to the writing. You said you're going to start about talking about tools, but are you talking right now about tools? <laughs> I, I'm talking about I'm talking about materials. So we started talking about materials, guys. So so I, I'm going to I'm going to go back to the tools. <laughs> okay. Now, the thing about the thing about the paper is, if the paper is too thick, it sits heavily on the on the desk, and the nib goes down to the paper, and the paper doesn't move. It doesn't interact with the nib. If the paper is thinner, it will flex as the nib is working. So understanding how the nib, this tool, will interact with the paper is really important. Now, if we're starting about tools, what kinds of tools are you using? By far the simplest tool, which is actually not simple at all, is the pencil. What's the best tool? So most of us... What's the best pencil? <laughs> uh, like... <laughs> What's the... <laughs> What's the best pen? <laughs> What's the best tool? Like, what? Which? Which tool is that? Because if I use that tool, my writing will be like that, right? Like at one point, at one point, I was like, this, this, those kind of questions, they were 
starting to annoy me really like like crazy i'm like <laughs> come on <laughs> like are you for real then I, okay, I learned okay people sometimes people don't have knowledge sometimes they're beginners but now i'm just laughing <laughs> on questions like this <laughs> it's uh, so what's the best pencil <laughs> okay so <laughs> personally i i like doent pencils i love my doent pencils so Derwent, I have used Derwent pencils since art school. I don't know how I, I went to London Graphics. Is Center. this the brand? And you know, it's a brand. Yes. So, so the, they, they make these pencils. Oh, okay. uh, actually, uh, just the design black and red seemed like uh, similar, like uh, something that I know, but then okay. the name. Okay. But the, I don't know. these are, these are Stadler. Okay. And these are. Paper Castell. Okay, I have a funny question for you. If Calligraphy Masters, by somehow, decides to make Calligraphy Masters pencils or collaborate with a brand, which that brand should be? That's a difficult question. Why? Because it, it depends on what kind of pencil you're trying to make. Bo, is there some time that I'm gonna <laughs> that I'm gonna ask a question and you're gonna answer every time, no matter what question it is? Oh, like, like, it's so crazy. <laughs> but, but no, it, but it does because, you know, for instance, if it's a general pencil, most people have HP pencils, right? HP pencils are your standard pencils. Okay, let's, let's so, say pencils for calligraphy. I don't know if this makes sense, like, but... No, it doesn't. It doesn't make sense at all. <laughs> Answer my... And the, reason, and, and, and the reason is this, right? You can do copper plate script with a pencil if the pencil is soft enough. So if it's like a 4B or a 6, or anywhere sort of 4, 5, 6, 7, or 8B pencils, the B means that there's more clay in it. So the, the, so it's always about the relationship of graphite to clay. What? So H is more graphite and B is more clay. Yeah, but it, it's, and it, the B it's makes, not like one brand is making just... To be pencils, like most, I guess, I mean, I, I'm not sure, but I believe one brand makes all kinds of pencils, right? Yes, yes, they so, do. In just so, just answer so, my question, which brand should be this that Calligraphy Masters makes pencils with them? <laughs> just well, pencils it, in it, general, it, I don't know. The, 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 there is another issue, and that is, <laughs> and, and you know, not to be political, but I, I love Derwent, don't get me wrong, I absolutely love Derwent. But you're not in the UK anymore. The UK is not in Europe anymore. And working with Derwent on something would become problematic, especially for import and export. Okay, then so, <laughs> answer me somebody that I can work with and that's... <laughs> okay, so if you're, if you're working with somebody in Europe, it could be either Faber Castell okay. or Stadler. Okay. Stadler makes excellent pencils as well. And um, I, 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 I would go for Derwent because I love Derwent and I, I love what they do and I love their tools and materials. But just dealing with that import and export issue is, is a nightmare. Guys, if somebody watching or somebody listening is part of one of those companies or if knows a person working in them, feel free to send them this video or this podcast. What kind of nonsensical question are you asking people? All you have to do is ask me. I, of course I have contacts oh, in these companies. This is, come on, like, <laughs> this, this is a boomer move now, right now from you. <laughs> this is a boomer move. <laughs> right. let, 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 let me just make a note about it. Send Milan, guys, put Milan in guys, contact. Don't with... listen to Paul. Just do whatever. <laughs> Please. <laughs> Come on. Like, I'm pretty sure a lot of people know what I mean. <laughs> this is just for the true supporters. <laughs> okay. So, um, right. So, getting back to yeah. pencils. So, the thing about pencils is understanding what the range is. So, we know that H is hard and B is soft. If you want to do something like copper plate script, a 6B pencil is really nice to practice with. If you want to do something like Spencerian, then you're probably more, you're probably better off with something like a 2B pencil. So it's just a little soft. Hmm. Um, just, Paul, I have a question. Drawing... I just, sorry. I have a... how, how do you know this stuff? Like, I'm like, I'm just writing down right now, 6B copper plate, 2B. <laughs> and I'm like, how the, how, how in the world would you know stuff like this? I, I went to art school, remember? <laughs> oh, yeah, yeah. So I, when I was doing my uprights, you know, we have this this free um, copper plate script training wheels that I did. 
So we, we developed these two PDFs, the Copperplate Script Training Wheels, to help people get a better understanding of how Copperplate Script works at 55 degrees and vertically. So I have this upright version that when I use a name, I call it Judy Script because my mom's name is Judy. And, <laughs> and in order to get this, that, in order to that, write that, out That's the pretty sweet that you, you named the script after your mother. It was, it was funny. I, I was showing her something and I said, I said, oh, look at this. And she went, wow, that's really beautiful, Paul. I really like that script. What's it called? And I said, I said, oh, you really like it? She said, oh, my gosh, it's so beautiful. I really love it. I said, it's called Judy Script. And she said, oh, that's, oh, my God. Thank you so much. I was like, oh, mommy. Oh, that's so cool, Paul. <laughs> That's that's yeah, really great. nice. Like I'm I'm blown away right now. And but you know what? Uh, that's for today's episode about this topic, guys. We continue in the uh, next weeks. Oh yeah, just before. So oh. guys, last last week, uh, Paul was talking about understanding tools and materials, and here we go. This week, him continue talking about it. All right, brilliant. So we were on pencils. Yeah. So we have this range of pencils, and we have bees. We have B's and we have uh, H's. We also have F pencils and they're, they're really, really hard. So understanding what I, I was talking about the Judy script when I was when I was developing the upright copper plate PDF, which is a free PDF we give away to people. Where can they get them? Get it? Uh, they can find it on 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 the teachable site. What? Yeah, um, let's say the, the site so people who are so, listening or watching, they can so, hear it and go so to it. <laughs> If you do a search for PA Scribe Teachable, you'll see our Teachable site come up and the, the PDF will be on the site soon. And Currently, it's on, on. And if you are watching on YouTube, I'll put a link in the description as well. Brilliant. Super. So when I was making this PDF, I wanted to work out what was the best, the optimum pencil for a script that used pressure and release. And it was, an, it was amazing to do this PDF because it helped me to work out different aspects of the pencils. If you press hard, or you know, you do this, if you have a death grip, we have a video, right? The death grip stops you from controlling the tool because you are holding it so tightly, you're shaking it. Now, if you, if you release the death grip, the tool responds better to the writing. So there's a video on, on my YouTube and, and on um, Milan, on Calligraphy Masters, um, about the death grip. So look at I have video. a question. Uh, is, is, yeah, you probably know, so <laughs> yeah, I'm just going to ask it. Is there a reason behind why people like me have such grip? Or is just something natural? Uh, usually, if you're not trained or taught properly to hold a tool or pencil and to write with it correctly you develop you develop you, you have to figure out how to hold it mm. and so it's it, it's quite you know there, there is a there is a path that you have to teach kids so you always start with a really big pencil and you get them to hold the pencil like this now if the pencil is small they will hold it like this because it's easy to fit between the fingers mm -hmm or they'll hold it like this. But if it's bigger, then they they need the scope of the fingers to hold it in place. You know, the problem is lots of parents don't know how to write themselves. So and lots of teachers are now young enough that they've been through that, that not able to write generation. Hmm. So it, it, it's really quite a, a, an unfortunate situation. The thing about the death grip is it stops you from interacting with the tool carefully. Also, you're accustomed to rolling around on the fingers rather than using the whole arm. Oh, man. So getting back to yeah. the tools. Now, if you have a death grip, means probably means you're, you're going to press hard. You're better off starting with something like a, a 2H pencil and then graduating to an HP because you're, you're wanting to train yourself to, to write lighter. If you have a medium grip, you don't press too hard or too soft, you can get away with an HB or a 2B pencil. If you have a very light touch, 
you can start off with a 2B and graduate to a 4B, and eventually you'll get up to 6B. I use an 8B pencil. Is there a certain time period that it's normal to go it's between? All down to how much practice you're putting in. Okay, yeah, fair enough. So, um, so I, I have this really cheap video. I, I kept we kept the price low because we wanted people to access it. Mm -hmm. It's it's again on Teachable, but it's it's the calligraphy and meditation video that we do, and in that video it teaches you how to breathe with the writing, and it helps you to lighten your touch and to to understand about accuracy of line. It's it's not a calligraphy video. We're not doing calligraphy in it, but we're doing line line writing with a pencil. And the first thing students learn is that they're not drawing, uh, they're writing the line. You said it's a cheap video. How cheap is this video? Oh, I think it's like twelve dollars. Okay, I have. It's two hours. I have a funny two hours of content. I have a funny idea. Let's create a special discount code. I know it's cheap, but let's make discount code fifty percent only for the people who listen to the podcast. Okay. Yeah? Okay, guys. So let me make a note. So of that. you'll find up uh, the discount code for this video fifty percent off only for for the people who listen and watch Nip's podcast. Understanding how, how the pencils work is your starting point. I always tell students, if you can't do it with a pencil, there is no way you're going to do it with a pen. Yeah. <laughs> because if you, can't, if you can't write a line with a pencil, a straight vertical line, if you cannot write a straight vertical line with even consistent uh, deposition of graphite with a pencil, how are you going to do it with a pointed flexible nib that has so many more problems? You're dealing with ink, you're dealing with pressure, you're dealing with variability of pressure, you're dealing with how the ink is interacting on the paper, you don't know how to hold the tool. So your pencil work is really, really important. Yes. Yeah, it's funny because when I was in London, I was doing the meditation class and we had to do for a lot of long time oh gosh, you're just right. lines with the pencil. And I was like, I was so annoyed. I was like, oh, I just want to do the stuff. <laughs> I know. No, I want to use the brush. Why do you make me make these lines? I was so frustrated. <laughs> but it was fun and it really helps. It makes difference. It's a very like annoying process, at least for me, it was. But <laughs> it's crazy. I think I think the first time you do it, the, you, you really, you, there are a couple camps of people. The first first camp is people get annoyed because they just want to do the writing. Other people get annoyed because they think, I thought I could write a line with a pencil. What's going on? <laughs> and other people get annoyed because they just don't understand what's happening. And the breathing as well is really important. So it's, 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 it does all the students that I have who have been going through the calligraphy and meditation class. And we've just done a two weekend, a, a two day workshop, really technical workshop on how to apply that to the writing of the script. They have all said it has dramatically changed the way they approach their writing because it teaches you how to breathe when you're writing. So getting back to the to the material. We have like a so under seven, eight minutes left, just keep in mind. Okay. So understanding a pencil work is really, really, really important. And it's not just about how the pencil works. How do you sharpen the pencil? So I always have a, I always have a little bit of sandpaper, and I sand, I sharpen my pencil on the sandpaper to get it a really nice fine point if I want a point. Um, I break the point off just at the top edge if I want a flat bit on the on the tip of the pencil. But then there are things like, don't let your pencils get dirty. If your pencils get dirty, every time you touch a sheet of paper, you're going to get dirt on the sheet of paper. So learning to be a little bit cleaner is really helpful for allowing you to produce really good work. Um, in the death grip video, we talk about using the eraser on the pencil to hold the page down so you're transferring tension from one hand to the next. So, you know, under, keeping the eraser clean is really important because if the eraser is dirty and you put it down on the page, it'll get the page dirty. So the little things like that, that, that you know, that you can set a little bit of time aside and actually make it into a little ritual because you know you you have to you have to show gratitude to your tools and materials you know Milan was talking in one of the early episodes how you know he had no tools and materials you know when i was growing up i asked my mother for some nibs and she said to me they're too expensive 
we can't afford them. And so I went down to the beach and I collected quills and I learned to cut with those. So I, I'm, I'm always so grateful for the tools and materials that I have access to because when I was growing up, I didn't have them. So, you know, showing your tools and materials that you're grateful is really important. Take the time, have a little ritual with them, sharpen them, see how they're doing. If you drop your pencil on the floor, the lead will break. So every time you try to sharpen it, it comes out in little chunks or the sharpener just breaks off every time. So, so you know, little things like that, that, you know, most people don't think about, you know, an HP pencil is not that expensive. But once you start going up to, you know, 4H and 6H or 4B and 6B, those pencils are a little bit more expensive. Why? So that's, well, because of the, the mixture of clay and graphite, they have to control it. And it's, yes. you know, it's, 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 it's a much, there's much more manufacturing happening in the process. Mm -hmm. um, and so that's, that's sort of your lead, your, your drawing pencils, your so black graphite pencils. And then, of course, there are lots of other pencils. Like this is a. So, if you look at these two pencils together, this is a charcoal pencil, and that is a lead pencil. Lead. So the charcoal pencil is round and it's bigger. It's really amazing to write with, but the only problem is it produces so much dust that the charcoal dust gets on everything. And then, you know, when you when you're drawing with writing or drawing with a pencil. You always brush it off when you do that with the charcoal it just smudges everything no, when i was in copenhagen i bought like just the shape of it, it was like piece of char uh chalk like this like this but it was a small piece i mean in this shape and i was using it as a broad edge pen to to make calligraphy oh yeah of course so you can it was pretty cool so so you know those of you just starting off don't waste your money on tools get some cheap pencils and you can you can get two rubber bands and you can strap them together double and pencil. make a double pencil. Double pencil, double pencil. <laughs> and your double pencils act like a big nib. So there are your pencils. There's a big nib. And you can see how they work as the outside of the nib. You can make a triple so, you know, pencil as well. Oh, you could do tons <laughs> of them. But you need some cardboard because then, yeah. you know, as you press them, they snap together in the middle. Which is not fun when you're in the middle of a letter, right? You're like, oh, what happened there? <laughs> no. um, and, of course, you can get carpenter's pencils. And the carpenter's pencils have a square oh, edge. It, oh, this is a, like, oh, this is what... Yeah. Uh, no, I know what are the pencils. I just never thought they are called the carpenter's pencil. Yeah, so they're carpenter's pencils. Hmm. Now I know. And the eraser for the the, the, the sharpener for the carpenter pencil is the coolest sharpener. There is a sharpener? Because you're sharpening it. Uh, yeah, there's a sharpener. I don't have one. I thought you'd just do it with a knife? No? Yeah, you can do it with that. But there is a sharpener and it's it's amazing. Do you have, so, do you have um, one? Oh, I don't have nah. one. I never got one because I always use a knife. <laughs> Fair enough. Um, so, and of course, those, those are your, your, your lead pencils. Then, of course, you go into color pencils. And that, that is a whole different kettle of fish. Hmm. So color pencils come in hard colors or they come in soft colors or they come in aquarelle color pencils. Derwent makes something called ink tense pencils, which are so vibrant have, and rich. Have you written with uh, liquid pencils? <laughs> liquid pencils? What are you talking just, about? Just mess. Have you written? You, 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 do you do your writing with liquid pencils? Or less? Is that, is that, is that so, what? Sometimes I do. <laughs> <laughs> uh, um, one minute <laughs> and, and, and then there are little little things like when I was at art school my tutor used to do this and I was like why is he doing that and he would lick the pencil and the little bit of saliva he, you know you just lick just the tip of the pencil it would make the pencil write in a really different way so I'm I, sure now you know, everybody I, is licking their pencil right now <laughs> So what I did was, what I did was, I, I got a little dish. Um, where am I? I got a little dish. Okay. And I put a little bit of water in it. And every now and then I touch the tip of the pencil just to the surface of the water and just tap it. So any excess water comes off. And it's, it's a really amazing technique because the pencil gets softer and it, oh, it's so beautiful to write it. Oh, so it's like a liquid pencil, right? Yeah. But 
Yeah, guys, it's it's been again two episodes talking about understanding tools and materials. If I don't stop Paul, he can talk forever on every kind of topic. So let's jump into. Oh yeah, I mean, if you feel like he should be talking even more on this topic, let us know in their own YouTube comments or at Nips Podcast DM at Instagram. Okay, ready. All right. So thank you guys for joining us. Uh, unfortunately, Milan has um, has been writing with a liquid pencil, and so he's fallen asleep. <laughs> okay. Yeah, guys. This is the first episode where we're gonna talk about. Uh, oh, so. So this segment we're gonna speak about layout and composition and this is the first episode in which we will discuss a topic suggested by you guys. This topic was suggested by someone, <laughs> I will write it somewhere here but I forgot to write the name. Anyways, he suggested it on uh, Nip's podcast Instagram account in the stories. So if you want us to discuss your suggestion, suggested topic or questions, Follow Nips Podcast on Instagram and uh, each week or from time to time there will be uh, a box where you can suggest uh, topics for us to discuss. Layout and composition, this is uh, something that I think is uh, super important and something that uh, I myself personal have been ignoring for a very long time. <laughs> and a uh, few weeks ago I was recording an episode with Nick Snooze One who who actually told me that he listened to the first uh, podcast and he really enjoyed it so shout out to snooze one but my point is when we were recording this episode he gave me his secret about his composition what did he say let's say what did Nick say? It. it's cool but i don't have knowledge i don't have experience that much with layout and composition so let's go again to our uh our atlas, <laughs> calligraphy atlas, <laughs> Mr. Paul Antonio, uh, uh, Atlas, Atlantica, <laughs> whatever. <laughs> I'm just kidding, guys. <laughs> All right. So layout and composition. So um, I, I developed this course on flourishing. <laughs> and I, when I was working on the course, and one of the things I'm always conscious of when I'm teaching is I don't like to regurgitate information. If I'm going to teach, I want to present information in a new way. And so this meant restructuring what I knew about flourishing. And in that flourishing class, I talked about these things, alignment, hierarchy, contrast, repetition, consistency, proximity, balance, color, space, simplicity, distribution, shape, texture, <laughs> movement, emphasis, unity, oh, and visibility. Like right. They're, so, they're, they're normal human beings like me. I'm like, what is this? This sounds like scientists, like so, science, science, so, like you make so it anybody, you know what? Anybody make, studying, <laughs> sometimes anybody you, studying typography, <laughs> anyone studying typography or graphic design. These are words that you have to learn at the beginning of your process. Yeah. But keep so, in mind, not stop. everybody knows these words. And sometimes you can, I, I, I know you're very professional and everything, and it's very beautiful for me to listen, but. Uh, at the same time, I'm thinking sometimes you you uh, the way you de you describe stuff it makes uh, it's made like it makes it feel like oh my god this is so much stuff this is so hard I I'm not able to do this. But the thing is, if you if you understand why something is the way it is, mm -hmm. it's very easy to reproduce it. You know, sometimes you you do a you do you do a, a layout mm -hmm. and it looks good but it could be a little bit better, but you're not sure what to do about it. But, and, but, and this is where this kind of thing comes into play, where you, you start looking over here. So what is the most important thing that I want to say in this piece of work? Before you start uh, talking and explaining the things, I have the same question as in uh, the last topic. What's the difference between a layout and composition? Well, I mean, roughly it's the same sort of thing. Yep. Layout is essentially the layout of the text okay. and composing it is putting it together. 
So one is one is a rough outline, and the other one is is much more in depth. Okay. Yeah, some so, people might think this is a stupid question, but guys, uh, not everybody. So you you do a rough layout, you sketch it out, and if you're going to compose it, you might write the actual text out, cut it out, and then place it so that you can you can actually see what it looks like when you have black letters uh, in, in black ink so that it, it helps you with the balance a little bit more. So the simplest layout, left justified. Just on the left, all the letters are aligned to the left. Mm -hmm. Those of us, you know, if you use a computer, you know, you can change this. You just go to align Left, button, center, can, right. Left align it, right, right align it, or center align it, right? Now, when when I when I was at Rygate, when I started um, art school, um, I remember being able to do this on Word, and I was so excited that you could do this on a piece of software. But of course, hmm. th this was a new thing. You couldn't, you know, if you wanted to left align something, you had to sort of check. You know, it was straightforward now. If you wanted to center text, you had to write out all the lines and cut up all the bits of paper, and we used something called uh, ox gum. And you'd stick, because ox gum was repositionable, and you'd stick it to the back of the layout paper, and you'd put it all in place so that you knew what the, the, that it was centered. And then you'd mark off, and that's how you would do your centering. Uh, a lot of calligraphers still use this method, because it's much more hands-on, it's really interesting, because They've written it out once they have a sense of the text and then they cut it up and they can they can change the layout the layout can be either symmetrical or asymmetrical so it's either balanced on down the center or and on both sides or it has a slightly ragged movement to it and this is one of the great things about cutting out the paper you can move it around of course you could do all of this you know in illustrator or in design but Touching the paper is, is really quite a very different experience. You know, I, I've seen I've seen this like, for example, in the calligraphers Bible, it's explained that, you know, how to do this cutting, but I personally myself, I never done this cutting. I've seen some people do it, but in my head it's like, like come on, this is way too much work. And like, but, it's, it's, but, it's, it's, it's okay, but I, I'm just a, a person who doesn't have, you know, have time to do it. The first time you do it, I, I hated it. I hated it at Rygate. Gina, my, my, my calligraphy teacher, Gina Goff, she always got us to do this, and I hated it. But our, our days, but, we, have, we have light paths. Is, is this not something that uh, helps you, like, yeah, but if, stuff if you're like trying this to work out, If you're trying to work out the layout, and you know you have 30 lines of text, yes, and you know that this is each line, let's say it's a poem or a sonnet. If it's a sonnet, it has, what, 12 lines? Uh, a what? A sonnet. So, you know, Shakespeare oh, yeah, 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 sonnet. Yeah, 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 yeah. So, if it's a sonnet, I think it has 12 lines, but the lines are ragged on the right side. So you'd have to write it out to know how they relate to each other. Just remember, when you're writing, there is a tendency for some letters to be bigger than others and some words to naturally be bigger than others. I learned this the hard way. Every time I wrote the word Emma, I would always panic because the E is big and then the two M's are really big. <laughs> and so I, I would go, oh, I'm writing Emma. I need to start on this side. Uh, so little things like that, you start to understand, okay, if you're, if you're writing a word like communication with lots of M's and I's and N's, the rhythm of the writing can sort of go a little bit crazy and it can mess up the word. And so when, you, when you've written this out once, you cut it up and you, you start putting it down on roughly, you've not stuck it down, you're just starting to put it on a sheet of paper, you'll find that your eye will go, I wonder if this line should be a little bit over this way. So, so the layout becomes slightly off center because you've written the text out. Now, by writing the text out once, you've already started in your mind to go. So this is the size, this is the height, the X height that I'm working to. These are the line lengths. And, and you, you get a sense of what you're going to do. And I know, you know, scanning it in and doing it on, on, on Illustrator is easier but you've also taken away, you've added another um, 
you've added another phase to the writing, which means you are not in contact with the writing. The mouse is doing the moving. It's on no, the screen. I never do this Whereas, actually. I don't. I never scan something and uh, like in, put it on Illustrator or do stuff like this. If for I myself, if I'm trying to achieve something and it's not working, I'm just writing it over and over and over and over again until I'm I'm happy. But I, I like. People should know I, I try to but, use as much as my as much as possible on my hands and not computers, not digital. But, but if you're writing out a scroll for a client, oh. <laughs> you don't have time to write it over and over and over and over. But, so it's important. No, like, that I you... think I think there are very few people in the world who are considered scri scribblers or people who are scribes. like you scribes, scribes like People like you who actually have cli such clients, <laughs> like I, I don't. Think yeah, okay, but but if if you're writing out a poem for yourself, okay, you know, and you want to, or you're writing out a poem as a gift for a friend, you don't want to be writing it over. You don't want to get to the point where you're fed up of writing the poem out for your friend. Of course, of so course. so doing this general layout is really important, and it, it really sort of it gives you a different way to interact with the lettering. Mm -hmm. So. So that, that's a great way to work on the layout. The next thing is, so we worked out that you have left justified, you have right justified. Of course, if you write, if you're right justifying the text because you want to draw an illustration on the left side, writing it out once tells you where you can start on this side. And hmm. um, so you've cut it up and you've sort of pasted it down, or you've done it in Illustrator, or in Design, or Affinity. Um, so once you've done that. You then work out if it's going to be symmetrical or asymmetrical. You can also work out the degree of um, symmetry. Is it going to be a little asymmetrical or a lot asymmetrical? So all of these things you can do in your sort of layout process. The next thing to work out is the hierarchy. What is the most important thing you want to see? And if it's the most important thing, then you can either write it in another script at a bigger size, which is normally two to three times the size of the X height that you're normally working in, or a wider nib at the same X height. So it stands out as a bolder like word or sentence or something. Or you can write it in a different color. So that's, that's a whole other discussion. <laughs> so the hierarchy tells you, you know, if you're going to go for something that is, you're going to have some punchy bits of text, or if you're just going to have the, the initial at the beginning of each line as a slightly bigger capital. So already that starts to help you with your layout. Mm -hmm. The next thing you work on is, is alignment. Of course, with alignment, we can have a central bar and we're scaling across that central bar. Now that's just working in a linear context, straight lines. If you decide that you want to do a circle like Maven, that that has well, its own wait, issues. Wait, just just for the record, just for the record, <laughs> I'm not doing just circles. Like, there, the majority of the stuff that I uploaded, it, it's it's circles. But I, I do a lot of shapes. This is what I enjoy. Calligraphy. Yeah, it's it, it's but, like it's uh, like you know, it's like I always do pointed pen scripts. Yes. Uh, <laughs> yes. <laughs> okay. Okay. That, okay. That. that Damn, that's good. Ah. <laughs> that's a good one. No, <laughs> that's that's so if, that's a instant if you, karma. <laughs> if you caught one of our earlier episodes, you'll understand that. Of course. Um, so, so you know, for oh. instance, if you're writing in a circle, how do you draw a big circle? Because you know, you, you might be using a small nib. You might actually be using a marker. If you're using a big marker, you know, you get a pin and a piece of a string and a and a, a pencil and you scribe an arc keeping the string taut now the other thing is you can use also a, cam a compass if it's not such a big uh, yeah circle. you can use a compass if it's not a big circle but how do the letters work on a curve so you also have to draw straight lines into the center because you know if, if it's textualis and the letter is that wide on a straight line it's actually going to have to do this yeah, you have to so separate the, the circle like a pie or cake, whatever. I don't know how to. Yeah. And, and so you need to to just bring it in at the bottom so that because, of course, there, there, there's, there's perspective to deal with as well. 
And so understanding how you're going to produce the text is really important. If you're working straight across the lines or if you're making a square pattern or a circular pattern. You, and... you know what else is super important? It's uh, super important to wrap up today's episode and continue talking about it next week. So last week, me and Paul, mostly Paul, <laughs> was discussing layout and, com and composition, and we continue this week again. Paul? So last week, we started looking at things like hierarchy and uh, symmetry. But there's, there's another aspect to layout which doesn't actually use all of these words, and that's you. <laughs> you me? kind of know, not you. <laughs> You, just you? Said this really? <laughs> you? <laughs> Don't let Milan influence your work, please. <laughs> never, never, please. <laughs> That's no, not honestly, a joke. <laughs> a, a big part of the, a big part of what you're going to design and how you're going to design it is entirely up to you. You have a sense of what you like, of how. Some people like straight lines, some people like curves, some people like curvy lines, some people like bigger words and smaller words. And, and, and you sort of know what you like. What do it you is... like? You. What do you like? Me. Yes. Me. I, I, li I like straight lines. Okay. I love writing text. You know what? Give me oh, a quill and some that, nibs. That makes sense. This is why you force everybody to make lines with their pencils. Go write straight lines. Straight I don't straight. force anyone to make lines uh, with their pencils. I'm just kidding. I, encur I encourage them strongly to make lines with their pencils. <laughs> you see, like, just because you speak so, like, so good language, you're benefiting. You can say stuff. <laughs> oh my god. <laughs> but, but you know, the reason why I love straight lines is, you know, I I love manuscripts. Oh really? My, my love of my craft is because of my passion of illuminated manuscripts. And I, I can sit and write pages of text in straight lines and not get bored because it's, I, I just I just love it. I absolutely love it. Oh, so I, I have a question. I think it's nothing what, with what? the... <laughs> Every... <laughs> okay, serious now. Come on, Paul. People are taking me crazy. Not that we're not, but uh, what's what's the biggest amount of time that you've written straight without stopping? Um, seventy-two hours. What? Like with sleeping or without sleeping? No, no sleeping. What? Wow. I wow. was in. I was. You know. I was. I was in my early twenties. And you know, when you're in your early 20s, you don't need to sleep. You're like, oh, I could do this. And you just sat there and I was just, I was actually doing a job. And <laughs> I, had, I, had, I, I had, this job came into the studio and I, I was still at Rygate. I was still training as a calligrapher. Mm. And um, I had to take the week off because um, the client, it was, it was for Jaguar. They were having this massive event and they wanted 8,000 place cards written in a week. And I said, yeah, yeah, I could do that. And then, <laughs> then the boxes started to arrive. Have you ever seen 8,000 place cards? Oh gosh, what? I thought I was going to die. And you know, the worst thing is, you know, the, the empty ones were on that side. So the boxes were going down on this side and I would put them on this side and they would send a courier at the end of every day. So all I was seeing was boxes on one side and I wasn't seeing them piling up on the other side. And I sat there and I just, I just hammered away at it for, for 72 hours. Um, and then I, I slept for five hours and then I, I did, I think I did 20 hours for the next couple of days and I finished it in a week, but that, Still, that was, that was crazy. insane. <laughs> but you know that, that, so, so going back to layout and composition and how, how this connects to what we're talking about, that that volume of writing of this, this wasn't, you know, playful writing that I was doing for myself. This was client work. So the work had to be of a very high standard. When you are writing that much constantly, and you know, I, I addressed envelopes and place cards for the last 20 years, every day, I've addressed millions of, of 
place cards and envelopes and invitations. When you've uh, done that kind how many of... I think I think when I was in London you you actually some kind of calculated how much exactly do you still remember how I much rem I have it written down on the computer. Oh you should let me know. And, and that level of writing at that level of accuracy and consistently and being conscious of the writing really helps you to become better at the script. And that's why I always tell people, you know, when you're working with straight lines, make sure you're touching the lines because then you are not having to work out the height of the lines. Actually, your breath does that for you. If you're actually inhaling and exhaling rhythmically, it, it generates the rhythm in the writing. So that rhythm can also affect you in the way that you compose, you, you lay out the work. When you're, when you're drawing, blocking pencil, if you're doing this, the work's going to be really tight. If you do nice big arm movements, you get much more generous space and much more generous strokes. So your layout should really be around you being relaxed and not tense. Because if you're too tense, then the layout shows that tension. Equally, when it comes to the writing of the work in that layout, the writing will will use that tension to affect the lettering. So be really conscious of how you're approaching this, this topic. So it's your turn, Milan. My turn to talk about layout and composition. Girls, guys, just forget about layout and composition. Don't use guidelines. Don't do anything. Just write, write, keep writing and stop listening to me. <laughs> no, I'm just kidding. But I, I mean, I have no knowledge about anything of those. Like, uh, I'm rarely writing myself, so I really cannot speak much about this. Uh, if you... <coughs> sorry. <coughs> if, you think, if you don't have anything else uh, to say about the topic, it, it could be just uh, finished and we can wrap there's the a, episode. There's a, there's a ton to say on this. Do you want yeah. me to go on? It, okay, it's, so... It, it's, it's easy to say, there is a ton to say about this when you're okay, Paul so. Antonio. <laughs> so, no. so we, so we've covered, you know, alignment. We've covered hierarchy. Then we have things like contrast. So, of course, with contrast, we have thin letters, medium letters, thick letters. We have tall letters, short letters, medium letters. How do these shapes work in relation to each other? So, of course, this this sort of connects to hierarchy because you could have a lot of text at the same height and one or two words that are bigger. So that, that increases the amount of contrast in the text because you're using hierarchy and contrast together. I'm just, I'm just uh, processing everything that you say. Like <laughs> Now, one, one of the great things, for instance, you know, Thiel Sun does this amazingly. He does a background of text of, of his fracture in a lighter color, and then he layers so that layering creates depth and perspective. But that's really when you start to look at things like color, when you're looking at hue, contrast, um, saturation of the color so that you're really drawing to people's attention. So that's, that's one of the other things to consider. But you know, don't forget, you, you need to be able to control your tools. Now, whilst you're looking at contrast, you could be using, let's say, a William Mitchell three and a half nib. A three and a half nib is <laughs> this size. So mm -hmm. if you're writing at three and a half, six nib widths, three and a half to do fracture will give you about that. You can also use this nib to write at 10 nib widths. It just means the letters will be thinner. So they can affect the way in which the contrast works within the block of text. So the writing can vary using the same nib. The great thing about using the same nib at different heights is that you're using the same tool. So the letters have a sort of synergy um, between them, amongst them, because they're written with the same tool. Uh, I'm, I'm, I was thinking, is the, like, are there specific kind of works that require using layouts and composition? And is there stuff that you can do it without using layout and composition? Um, I, I find that 
How important is it in general? So, so, so okay, I, I did a lot of wedding work. And most people, when I started doing wedding stationery, when I started designing our wedding stationery, most people, in their minds, their idea of a wedding invitation was copper plate script, centered text, black ink, <laughs> white paper, done. That was it. I didn't want that. I, 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 I would say to clients, they'd say, oh, can I get it in, in black and white? I'm like, That's, uh, that is not what we do here. <laughs> Go to a graphic design and they'll do it. Wait, like, wait, I'm, I'm confused. I'm confused. Like, in my head, you're the person who always just used black, black ink. And now you're just saying this. I'm like, what? Not, not, not for my stationery. Okay. So my stationery for, for weddings or for events was always centered around spending time with the couple. What did the bride like? What colors did she like? What did the groom like? What colors did he like? What are the colors of their bridesmaids and, and, and their groomsmen's suits? What are the colors of the flowers? And I would take all those colors and I would come up with a hierarchy of color structure. And my, my wedding stationery was so beautiful and colorful and full of color. It is, it is something amazing, something one of a kind people. Like I've seen uh such work with other calligraphers and other artists but there there is nothing even close to the stuff that paul has he has a huge folder full of this like oh my god i cannot explain this is like pure eye porn seriously guys that's such beauty such uh, details and mm, you you really have to see it maybe sometime he can show it to you but it is amazing so there, there is a there is a, a video on uh on my instagram tv where I've looked at some of the some of the work that I've covered. So there's a section on my IGTV which is about my life. Okay. And I talk about my life growing up and I talk about how I came to to be able to doing the crown office scrolls. Then I talked about my work in the events industry and then I talked about my work in the wedding industry. Mm -hmm. So there's there, there are they're, they're like an hour, hour and a half long. So there's quite a lot of stuff there. <laughs> Um, anyway, so the color is really important because if you're doing so, so sorry, if the, 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 so if you're if you're design so so so, in, so initially you know it was down the middle, you know symmetrical design, center text, black ink, white paper. If they really wanted to be edgy, they would go for dark blue on white or possibly black on cream paper but that was it right that was it so this is you know this is 25 years ago okay and i didn't want that i was like this is so boring i'm not going to give you my beautiful work to make it look boring no no <laughs> you need to choose a color now jeff smith makes this uh this they have this amazing range of paper called color plan and color plan has like 80 colors in seven to ten different weights and so I, I started using these colors together, but I also started to offer different layouts. It was either centered or it was asymmetrical. So it was sort of like that, or I would fill the card with flourishing. So all the letters knitted together to create this sort of woven pattern. Um, or it would be right justified because I would do an illustration of the church on the left. So, you know, the fact that, that you need layout, you need good layout and composition in, in, in anything you do. You know, I'm working on a really big project, which is a lot of writing. And I'm still working out the layout because it's, I think it's like 400 pages of writing. What? But <laughs> are you, I'm trying are you, to work Are you writing a, a manuscript or what, like a book I, in calligraphy? Yes, I am. What? I'm, I'm trying to work out the layout, how the, the amount of text on this side to the translation on this side. And, you know, it's, I can't do it on a computer because I, I need to sense what's going to happen with Nib. So I've written this out in six different scripts. I've written it out in, in, to see how it feels because you can't feel it when it's on a screen. Okay, okay. So uh, it, well, it, what, it what doesn't is the matter. Book? Uh, leave the leave the uh, layout and composition guys everybody go spam spam poll on uh, instagram ask what is the book what is the book what is the book hashtag what is the book <laughs> it doesn't matter what you're doing you 
as soon as you spend some time doing some thumbnail sketches, you'll find that the layout becomes a lot easier. You know, if you're writing out a poem and you're going to use gold, where is the gold going to, going to go? Uh, if you're going to do an illustration, is the illustration going to be on the bottom, on the side, across the top? Is the poem going to sit in the middle? All of this comes down to good layout and composition. And it's best that you sort it out early rather than you're in the middle of the thing and you go, oh, it's not going to fit on the page, right? So it's, it's, it's really important that you spend the time just even if it's doing a, a quick thumbnail sketch, then at least you can scale it up properly. And what also is important is to finish today's episode. Thank you guys for watching. Thank you guys for listening. Uh, depending where you consume this podcast, please support it. Like, subscribe, follow, give a rating. I don't know, depending on the platform. Uh, give us feedback. And let us know if there's anything that you want us to talk about. Yes, you can suggest your topics or your questions on Instagram at Nips Podcast. Uh, thank you guys for watching. Thank you for listening. And as always, keep writing. Keep writing correctly. <laughs> yes, that's the new one. This is no, this new, the, it's not the new one. This is uh, post own. Keep writing correctly. <laughs>